Now that we've had a chance to talk about the physical effects associated with solvation, let's turn to looking at some of the ways to include condensed phase effects in actual calculations. And let's begin with explicit solvation. So I like to think of there being sort of rules associated with solvent modeling. And rule number one when it comes to explicit solvent modeling is it takes a lot of solvent molecules to actually look like a solution. Or put differently, if you only have a few solvent molecules, then you've got a cluster. And a cluster is great if you're interested in modeling clusters. And certainly clusters can be very interesting. Aerosols in the gas phase may be clusters. But they're not necessarily like bulk solution. So as a result, if you really want to solvate something, you need an enormous number of solvent molecules. And so here's just an example of a, a tRNA microhelix, is the sort of hidden blue and green colors in there. And it is surrounded by a ball of water molecules. So every one of these, you can see on the outside here, here's one water molecule with its central red oxygen and its two little white hydrogens. Uh, this is how many solvent molecules it takes just to sort of roughly cover it and maybe have a few layers in between the solute molecule, the tRNA species, and a, a boundary region. Because of that, because there are now so many atoms in the system, quantum mechanics can be a rather expensive proposition. There is actually a density functional approach known as Carparanello, which allows one to do molecular dynamics with a density functional uh, Hamiltonian, and it certainly enjoys a lot of uh, popular activity, but it is still quite expensive and it uses a lot of computer time. Uh, and as a result, really most of the modeling that's done in this area tends to be done with a force field. Uh, so molecular mechanics, because you've got so many atoms and your system size is so large, you need a very efficient way to compute energetics. So, of course, there are then many uh, tricks one can play in order to try to uh, take advantage of efficiencies in the modeling. One is to use periodic boundary conditions. And in a periodic boundary condition, you would have some sort of uh, system of a solute in a bunch of solvent that is in some replicatable cell. And you replicate the cell in all directions and uh, have a, a periodicity that hopefully doesn't influence your properties because you've got a really big cell, but it makes the calculations more efficient because of that periodicity. There's also something known as Ewald summation that lets you do electrostatics out to infinity. We saw that when we looked at the uh, discussion paper having to do a zeolite modeling. And finally, there are uh, QMMM approaches, and they can be used to uh, use quantum mechanics for a limited region and molecular mechanics for a larger region, and we'll hear more about that later in the course. Uh, and Gérald is uh, someone I was lecturing with when I first made this slide, so let's just ignore Gérald for the moment. Okay, uh, so what do we get out of the modeling? Well, one nice thing about the solvent uh, being there, even though it's very expensive, is that it is actually there. That is, we can analyze the solvent. And one interesting feature that you may want to look at would be the solvent density. And so thinking about how you would go about doing that, imagine you've got a biomolecule. Here's my a whole bunch of stuff looking a bit like a biomolecule. I guess there's a little sulfur hidden in there. So let's say that this is my periodic cell that's being replicated in all directions. And I can imagine dividing up that cell into little cubes. So I've got my biomolecule in there, and in these cubes would be solvent. So one of the things you can do is just at every step in your calculation, count how many solvent molecules are in a given box. And you can make the boxes as small or lar as large as you want. And given that you know the bulk density of your solvent, and given that you know the volume of your box, you should be able to compute how many water molecules would be there on average if it was just plain old bulk water. And if you discover that there are some boxes that have a far higher number of water molecules than expected and others that have far fewer, well, then you would expect that there is some special interaction that's very favorable for the water, right? A higher population means a lower free energy in the region where you have high density, and maybe there's a hydrophobic interaction that's repelling water out of a different box. And you can use that to understand the solvation of the underlying solute. And so in this particular reference that's down here, now getting a little bit old, uh, that microhelix of RNA I showed you in an earlier slide, 
is shown here without the surrounding waters, but with the solvent density analysis. And so what you're looking at here are regions in yellow contour lines where you find water with a far greater probability than uh, would otherwise be expected for bulk water. And so this is for a particular microhelix that has a GC base pair here, so that's a, a normal canonical base pair. And really, you don't see many of these regions. You see a very small number, and those are associated with so-called spine of hydration waters. So in polynucleic acids, the phosphate backbone tends to bind some waters, and that's what you're looking at. On the other hand, in simulations that were run for uh, mutants of this GC, and in particular a GU base pair and a 2-amino adenine isocytosine base pair, one sees kind of lighting up a contour interval right at the base pair itself, indicating a water that's sitting in the minor groove of the RNA, and that leads to some uh, interesting correlation between activities Turns out this is the wild type tRNA that gets amino acylated by a certain enzyme, and this one is dead to that enzyme. So it seems like that water may make a difference. And of course, once you've identified these regions of high water density, you can zoom in and snapshots and take a look, and you will discover that, sure enough, so here's this GU base pair, and it has, uh, I'm sorry, that is not, that is the lower base pair. Here is G and U, and this is a cytosine because it's got an amino group there. But GU is a so-called wobble pair, and the reason that it binds water so strongly is the poor amino group of guanine has nothing to hydrogen bond to because this is not its normal partner C. Uh, the pair wobbles instead to make these two hydrogen bonds, so it, it recruits a water, and it hydrogen bonds to the water, and the water hydrogen bonds to the empty lone pair of the uracil, and that's why there's a water there far more often than would otherwise be expected in bulk water. Okay, well, some other rules for explicit solvent modeling. Well, if you want to get some sort of an equilibrium property, like a free energy, you really have to average over phase space. So we've already seen phase space when we talked about molecular dynamics, but the issue of here, of course, is that there are many, many, many minima, and you have to... Uh, sample them in some appropriate way in order to understand what's the on average distribution within the system of structures or energetics or whatever you may be interested in. So sampling phase space is certainly a key issue. Brute force is extremely difficult as we as we saw earlier when we looked at um, molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo methods and free energy convergence can be slow. So we do use uh, Monte Carlo or MD techniques and tend to sample until we seem to have convergence, that is, until we seem to have ergodic behavior. Of course, a more robust approach is to do multiple trajectories with different starting points and make sure that we're always converging to the same sorts of properties. And I'll just remind you, these are slides you've seen before, but when it comes to integrating over phase space, if there's some expectation value that we're interested in, and that, whether a quantum one, we've mostly been talking about quantum chemistry up till now, but we'll go back to classical. A classical expectation value, that is the average property you expect to observe, is dictated by a relative probability of being in different regions of phase space. And remember what the equation looks like is, if I've got some property xi I'm interested in, and xi depends on the exact point in phase space, then by integrating over the entire space and weighting the value of the property at every point by the probability of being at that point, and this is just normalization of probability, uh, that's how I would get my average expectation property. And I'll remind you that the probability is just Boltzmann uh, weighted, so e to the minus the energy, which could depend on coordinates and momentum. Often we're interested only in coordinates happily. And this thing in the denominator is what we call the partition function. So that is the sum over all possible energy states. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in the course, of course the trick in sampling is don't waste a lot of time computing values of xi if the probability of ever being at that point in space is zero. Then you just wasted computer time. And uh, the trouble is, of course, that phase space is very large, so you need smart sampling methods in order to achieve ergodic sampling. And I already have really dealt with this, so I'm just going to breeze through that. Nevertheless, uh, with you know, good convergence, good assessed convergence, both Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics provide uh, ready access to many properties in solution. 
And some of the more popular ones that you'll certainly see in uh, literature papers would include simply structures. That is, you are interested in the dynamical structure of hmm, perhaps a biopolymer uh, because they're big molecules and you need to include a lot of solvent to understand them. Uh, they are flexible, so really their structures come along with standard deviations. And actually, often they are solved by taking some experimental data. And so, for instance, you might be doing some NMR nuclear overhauser effect measurements. And what nuclear overhauser effect NMR tells you is when certain things are close to one another, uh, you will see a signal. So if you do see a signal, you know they must be relatively close to one another. And you can add that as a constraint to your molecular dynamics that you will uh, insist that certain things be within a certain distance of one another. And that improves your ability to, co to converge structures. You can also actually look at quantum mechanical properties by typically taking out a subset of snapshots. So you may run a trajectory of, let's say, a million different steps. They could be Monte Carlo steps, they could be MD steps. Now, you don't actually want to do the quantum mechanical calculation on your substrate. Let, let's say it's ET30 from our last lecture, and you just want to compute the uh, absorption in the electronic spectrum for the S0 to S1 transition. And you might do that by doing a quantum calculation on ET30, surrounded by maybe its nearest 15 solvent molecules. However, you don't want to do that a million times, so you might select, for instance, every hundred or every thousandth snapshot an average over those. So a smaller average, but doing the quantum mechanics on, on configurations selected by a, a larger uh, trajectory. And, of course, if you're interested in the structural details of the solvation shell itself, first shell, maybe second shell, if there is structure to it, of course, you'll never get that from an implicit solvent model. And so remember that the structural details like a solvent uh, shell are usually expressed in a radial distribution function. And again, this is a little bit of a review, but I'll, I'll go through it briefly here. So the radial distribution function here is G. And what it does is you basically, if you're interested in a particular uh, separation between, say, atoms A and B, then you will look over all the occurrences of atom A and all the occurrences of atom B. So I is running over all the A atoms and J is running over all the B atoms. And you just sort of count up is the actual distance for a given pair equal to r, because I'm determining a value for r here, and then I normalize by the number of atoms a and b, and I take account of the fact that as I make r bigger and bigger, the volume that has that value of r, the surface area actually, uh, is expanding, so I want to have a function that, that ends up at large, uh, at large r equal to 1. And so what you'll see is a, something like this. So these histogram peaks, those are associated with this counting function. Delta is just like a Kronecker delta, except that it actually has some finite width here. And so every time I find A and B within this distance, I would add one to this histogram, pop, 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 pop. And when I'm all done, I just draw a smooth connection through my histogram for all N sub A times N sub B pairs, because that's how, how many times I'll put something into here. And that defines the radial distribution function. So what you see here is that apparently there is some sort of interaction that makes it uniquely favorable to be separated by this much. And then there's a certain region where they're uh, not that happy to be found, perhaps because it's in between a first shell and a second shell distance. In this particular uh, radial distribution function, there is a favorable second shell position. And eventually you get to just sort of noise, where you're far enough away that the likelihood of finding atom B from atom A is just dictated by their uh, relative abundance in a solution. All right, well, those are some of the uh, high points of explicit solvent when it comes to looking at structural details or selecting snapshots from trajectories. In the next lecture, I want to continue to look at explicit solvent, but I want to focus on something we haven't looked at yet when discussing uh, Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics, and that's something called free energy perturbation. And that's very useful for understanding free energy changes associated with variations in substrates in solution. And we'll see that next.